Hi, folks. It's Foss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Hey, we're coming here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. We always appreciate it. Have I ever told you that before? Thousands of shows. Uh, I never told you that before. We really appreciate you after 13 years of continuing to tune into the show and see what's going on. But you know what? If you haven't pressed that uh, bell notification button on youtube.com, put that on your to-do list because, you know, it just makes you feel like you accomplished something. You join a family that doesn't judge you. And what things are better than that, really? You get something done, you can just... You can just leave early if you press that uh, bell notification button on YouTube because you've you've done your work for the day and accomplished. You're at the peak of your mountain. Anyway, guys, I uh, also got all the groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. See everything we're doing over there. Our big uh, LinkedIn newsletter over there is killing it in our 132,000 member LinkedIn group. Go join that thing as well. Go to goodreads.com forward slash Chris Foss. You can see my books over there and also all the books of other brilliant people reading and reviewing as well. Today we have Professor James Goodwin, PhD. He's on the show. He's going to be talking to us to, about his exciting book, Supercharge Your Brain, How to Maintain a Healthy Brain through your life it just came out april 1st 2021 i believe that we have that day right there we go and uh so we're gonna be talking about his book how to supercharge your brain he even just added for the u.s market a special chapter on covid so we'll be talking about some of that data as well so before we get to him he is the director of the brain health network and a special advisor to the global council on brain health he holds an honorary chair at the university of Exeter Medical School is a visiting professor in physiology at the University of, oh man, I knew that was going to get me. Loughborough. 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 <laughs> we went over this in the pre-show and I still like brain fart on it. Uh, and he's clear, I need to go back to university. And he is also a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. He's a former army officer and a graduate of Sandhurst. He lives in Devon. Devon? Devon. 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 I got to work on my British uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. vowels or something. And when he's not writing books, he enjoys country pursuits, walking his and walking his dogs. Welcome to the show, James. How are you? Chris, it's uh, it's great to be on the show. Great to be talking uh, to your audience. And I hope we can entertain them uh, as well as inform your readers. And I hope they buy my book as well. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And I probably need your books because my brain clearly isn't working this morning. I can't even pronounce universities. Uh, so give us your dot coms, your plugs, where people can find you on the interwebs. If people go to uh, brain.health, uh, they'll find out all about the Brain Health Network. And most of the messages and information I'll be giving today, you'll find on that website. Um, you'll also find uh, click on to buy the book as well. Uh, you can also go to Pegasus Books, New York City. If you go on to uh, their website, you'll find the book also. And I have a personal website, drjamesgoodwin.com, and you can find little bits and pieces on there about me and about the book as well. There you go. So what motivated you want to write this book? I think you've written a few other books too as well. Um, what motivated me to write the book was a phone call out of the blue. Some people might call it serendipity or fate from Penguin Books in London. And uh, the phone call said, um, is that uh, Professor Goodwin? Yes, it is. Would you like to write a book for us on brain health? Uh, I was a little bit stunned to get a call like that from nowhere. Uh, and I said, how did you find me? And they said uh, uh, they looked on the Global Council for Brain Health website. That's an organization sponsored by AARP. Many of your audience will, will know of them. Uh, and they said, uh, we wanted someone from Britain, and there were only two of you on that site, uh, to write the book, and you're the first person we called. So that's, that's how it all started. I, I, I didn't have to write a book and then hawk it around all the different publishers, getting rejection after rejection. Many of my friends and colleagues have done that. It fell into my lap. Wow. So that's that's what you call a bit of good luck, Chris, and it's worked out real well. Yeah, I, I just got, uh, anytime I, I, I called for, uh, hey, you want to publish my book? It, they hung up on me, so I just published my own. Uh, anyway, so what? give us an overall arcing uh, view of this book. The book really attempts to let people know 
um, how to look after their brains right across their uh, lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the people who don't have a brain? I see a lot of those on Facebook. Yeah, well, uh, there are people living out of the ether. We know this. <laughs> uh, but anybody, anybody who can chew gum and walk in a straight line simultaneously is going to benefit from my book. Right. Um, what I really wanted to do was dispel what I call the, the three lies in one, the big myth about how we think, and that is, as soon as you get to retirement age or even before then, you start to go into decline, it's inevitable, and you can do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. And that myth is widespread, not only on your side of the water, but in Britain as well. And what the book does is to scupper all those lies and put, bring a bit of optimism into people's minds. Mm -hmm. Um, so is, is this something we need to do throughout our whole life? Is this something we should just start worrying about? You know, like I, I hit 54, I think in a couple of days and, you know, I have more supplements and more vitamins and more yeah. pills I have to take every day. And those are just the ones that are, are giving me my drug dealer. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just kidding. It's a joke. People <laughs> don't do that. Um, but no, I just like, and, and some people last night, they're like, Hey, here's some more uh, workout pills for your gym work. I'm like, come on, man. Yeah. Um, so is this something we need to be doing all of our lives? Uh, how's that work? Well, you're quite right about, um, the internet. You go on there looking for something to help your brain and people will be trying to sell you some snake oil. Chris, there's no one silver bullet that is going to cure all the problems that people might have with their thinking skills, you know, throughout their lives. It's uh -huh. not. Any single thing you do on one day, it's the single things you do every day. That's oh. the thing that matters. And there's no uh, easy way, um, but it's not difficult. There's no easy way, but it's not difficult. So you can't pop a, pop a tablet. And then uh, suddenly, you know, two or three days later, you're thinking better. Your memory's working okay. You're putting your words together well. Um, that doesn't happen. But you can do simple things which are not onerous, not difficult, that will enable you to stay sharp and mm. stay sharp right till the last years of your life. So what are a few of those simple things that we can touch on? People don't like to hear the first one I'll mention, and that is uh, there's a lot to be said for uh, physical exercise. Ah. But it's not what you think. Most people believe that if they simply jog or cycle or play tennis or swim 30, 40 minutes a day, that's going to be the answer. There's another side to the coin. And the other side of the coin is if you're a couch potato and you have a sedentary lifestyle, so you're sitting, you're sitting down for eight to 10 hours a day, then the effects of that exercise can be completely um, obliterated by that um, lazy lifestyle. What mm. you have to do is on the one hand exercise and on the other hand, make sure that what I call you declare war on the chair. Mm. It's easy, Chris, it's easy to spend eight to 10 hours a day sitting down. We ride to work. We sit down at work. We sit down to enjoy things. We, we're in front of the laptop. It's easy to do eight to 10 hours. And even if you exercise, that isn't enough to overcome the effects of that bad sitting down life. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I've noticed since I started going to the gym more in the last five months, I've been really just going every day. And uh, I've noticed that it's it's uh, made a huge difference in my mental state, my yeah, sharpness, well. my focus. I think my eyesight's improved a little bit. Um, it, it, it's had a huge effect on me that I was just like, wow, this is, I should have been doing this a long time ago. Yeah. Chris, do you want to know a big secret? Do you want to know how that works? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's the litmus test. That's the acid test. Can we explain how it works? Sure. When you're at the gym and you're on the cycle or you're on the treadmill or you're lifting the weights and whatever, your muscles are producing special proteins or hormones. Mm. And these leak out into the blood. They get flushed into the brain. And there they produce a chemical which promotes the growth of new brain cells. That's an astonishing discovery. But best of all, I think it was 2019, a, a team in Spain in Madrid they found that the brain produces new brain cells every decade of your life. Hmm. So from your 20s, 30s, all the way through until your 90s. And of course, the old theory was the gas tank is full and when you're in your 20s, you use it up as you drive through life and then by the time you get to 90, you're on empty. You, you oh, know, wow. Yeah, that was the old, the old thinking. That 
is now known to be false. And the great news is that you do the right things, exercise and activity, a good lifestyle, good active lifestyle is one of them that will keep those new brain cells being produced. Oh, wow. So we need to make sure that uh, those those brain cells are keep being producing. You know, that, that, that probably explains why uh, older people are smarter than younger people. <laughs> well, uh, there was a great study in Edinburgh called The Disconnected Mind, and mm. uh, they tested about a 1,000 people right into their 60s and 70s, and all these people had had their IQ measured when they were 11 on the same day. Scottish government, Scottish government measured the IQ of its whole nation of children uh, in 1947. Now, these people now, 70s and 80s, they, they all had their, their brains tested again, their genetics done, their blood work done, all of this. And what they found was some of the people in their 70s and 80s were doing better than they were when they were 11 years of age, when the brain is really sharp. Ah. They were doing better in their old age. So this idea that we're going to get worse throughout our lives is not strictly true. Mm -hmm. well, so what are what are some other steps that we can take to to uh you know have better brain health uh i missed the first part of your question chris uh what are some more steps that we can do that uh to you know increase our brain health sure well another big one is um diet but again mm -hmm. this is uh this is not what you think one of the things about diet is it's not just the nutrients you swallow it's how much mm. And there was, uh, if we overeat and we have too many calories, then that's going to suppress brain function. And if you do that over the whole of your life, by the time you get 70 or 80, you'll be in trouble. There was a, a great study done in, uh, in Munster in Germany. Uh, it was a, a joint study between the U.S. I think, I believe it was Harvard or Yale. Um, and this study looked at people who cut their calories, not their nutrients, not the food value, but their calories by 10%. Mm. Increase their memory by 20% over wow. the course of about three to six months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we know that if you're filling your face full of food every day, okay, and you've got, you know, you've got uh, struggling to get into your genes on a daily basis, right? That is not a good idea for your brain over the course of your life. And actually, cutting down by 10% of your normal calorie intake every day is, uh, is not that hard to do. Yeah. You just cut out like, uh, I think 20% is the shake, those shakes that people get. They, they call coffee from Starbucks. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've gone to Starbucks. I, I used to go to Starbucks and see what, uh, see what people were getting there. And I'm just like, you know, they got, it's basically a candy shake. It's not coffee. It's a candy shake. You're just like injecting sugar in your mainstream. So how, how important is some of the stuff in, in your book or do you talk about dementia, Alzheimer's? There's a lot of late stage things that affect brains and, and, you know, yeah. people that don't have that, those issues yet, hopefully they won't get them. Uh, but you know, it's, some things are inevitable. Um, is there ways to, you know, try and make your brain stronger and healthier so that maybe you can last longer through, uh, yeah, you know, well, those downturns. There, there are. Um, the development of something like Alzheimer's disease is a long-term job, Chris. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't happen overnight, and you don't suddenly get to be at risk from it, you know, on your 65th birthday. It doesn't happen like that, fella. Hmm. What happens is a process called neurodegeneration, a decline in the number and the working of the brain cells starts in some people when they're in, in their 30s, 30, 35, 40, mm. and it carries on a pace for 30 years until people start to notice that the daily things they try to do, like uh, looking at their investments and adding up the numbers, uh, working out their shopping bill as they're going around, uh, remembering names, where have I put my keys and all this, suddenly starts to quicken up. Uh, and that's at the long end of that process. So it isn't something that happens just when you get old. So actually countering neurodegeneration, putting your boot on the throat of aging throughout your life is something that's really, really important. Um, what about like, uh, well, you talk in your book too about how important sleep is in social life. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, we can bring in a bit about COVID here. Okay. Um, but, uh, social life is enormously important. Um, why? Because 1.5 million years ago, we became hunter-gatherers. And if you were one-on-one -on -one with an antelope, and if there are people who hunt on your show, 
uh, they'll know this, one-on-one -on -one with a white-tailed deer, an antelope or a zebra, as people did in Africa where we evolved, you were going nowhere and you'd have starved to death in no time. The secret to that was working in groups. So it became a survival imperative in the brain. And our brain has got what we call social cognition. That's the capability to mix with other people. There's a great experiment done again between Germany and the United States. Group scientists looked at some chimpanzee infants and some human infants. And on the physical prowess, they were neck and neck. They could climb, throw, jump, leap, crawl, run, all this stuff, neck and neck. They were, they were equal. But when it came to social activity, the human infants, talking about kids two years of age, were head and shoulders above the chimpanzees. They could form groups. They could divide up the work. They could appoint leaders. The leaders would get people to do things. Their social ability was totally amazing. That's all in our brains now. You try and shut that down, you damage the brain. Mm. And what happens is levels of what we call inflammation rise in the blood. And that increases neurodegeneration, increases the risk for dementia, makes the brain work less well. Harvard, did a, yeah, Harvard did a study, and they, this is a huge number. It was uh, 8,000 people over 12 years. Wow. Those who said they were lonely, their brains declined 20% quicker than those who said they were not lonely. Yeah, because you just you're just walking around your house talking to yourself. I found myself doing that a lot during uh, <laughs> yeah. COVID when I was trying to write a book. And I did the worst thing ever. I tried to write a book and I went on a fasting diet, uh, well, inter intermittent fasting diet. And, uh, you know, I'm losing my brain trying to write a book and, you know, you can't go anywhere. Um, I think, you know, I think we're all mentally damaged after COVID lockdowns. I think, I think we, we need, I think we all need like international or national mental health uh, program. <laughs> But yeah. uh, it would help if it would just get damn over so we could hang out and go do stuff again. Um, what about like I've, I've heard uh, how, let's talk about sleep because a lot of people don't understand. It's really important to get your sleep. And the older I've gotten, the more I realized that, you know, like I, I, I had a hard night last night um, where for, I, you know, I worked out really hard with my legs. I took a bunch of uh, protein and I was just fired up for like four hours till like 4 a.m which is why i'm a little off today and um you know i i'm building muscles i guess you know what are you gonna do but i i was just wired and could not go to bed and um i was laying there looking at my phone going which i shouldn't have been doing either but but you know i've learned that if i don't get my eight hours of sleep uh chris foss doesn't perform well the next day yeah. and you know I, I can cheat sometimes and get away with a nap but nine times out of 10, it's not performing well. And a lot of people think, uh, I can get away with less, um, but you really need that to heal your body and heal your mind as well. Let's sure. talk about that a little bit. Across all populations around the world, we need between seven to eight hours of sleep per 24 hours, and that doesn't change as you get older. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, I need less sleep as I get older. Well, there are a lot of individual differences, so some people might get away with that. But the average across a population, you're talking about 333 million people in the U.S., the average requirement is seven to eight hours per 24 hours. When you're younger, you get it all in one go. People yeah. go to bed at 11, and then they'll get up at 7, 8 in the morning, and they get all their eight hours in one go. And they go deep into sleep, and then they'll come up with you know some difficulty, sleepy in the mornings and the rest of it. Yeah. Okay? As you get older... It isn't that you need less sleep. The nature of sleep changes. So it's harder to get down. It's harder to fall asleep. It's easier to wake up. And the result of that is that you feel a bit sleepy in the mornings. The golden rule is you've had enough sleep if you feel okay in the morning. If you don't feel okay, you haven't had enough sleep. It's a great, mm. it's a great rule. You can get six hours sleep a night when you're 70 or even when you're 50, and then make it up with a nap in the afternoon. But don't go more than 40 minutes. If oh, really? You go, yeah, if you go more than 40 minutes on a nap, 40, 50 minutes, what you do is you drive down the chemical signal in the blood. That means when you get to 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night, there isn't enough sleep chemical in the, in, the, uh, in the blood, and the brain doesn't feel sleepy. So you stay awake longer you get less sleep and then you nap longer the next day and it's a vicious circle going downwards. I've gotten into some of those vicious circles over the things. I used to nap really like two or three hours in the afternoon. 
Uh, and I was sleeping for like four hours at, at night and yeah, it was just, it was just killing me. But part of it was, you know, just the worrying about the coronavirus, the COVID and the world. And are you, are we going to sure. be here tomorrow? You know, it's just the whole, the whole yeah. mental thing. And I was in a pretty good place consciously, but I think subconsciously we we're all a little bit yeah. in, in, jacked up on anxiety. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, so we talked about COVID. Um, I, I, what about, what about different activities for your brain? Like I have heard different theories, like doing strategic things with your brain, like reading, educating yourself, challenging your mind, uh, strategic games like chess, uh, you know, different things, crossword puzzles, you know, is there any merit to those things? All the things that you mentioned, which add up to challenging your brain are the ones that actually preserve your mental sharpness your mm. your faculty of thinking skills as you get older if you're just cruising in your comfort zone and you're just doing the same puzzles and crosswords and they're not making any demand on you mm. well it's probably making you feel better and your arousal levels in the brain are up a little bit but it's not going to do as much good as really pushing yourself psychologists call these cognitive stimulating activities so uh, they're things like dancing, learning to dance, learning to learning to use a language. Actually, Chris, you can do both. So if you're a Spanish speaker, learn to dance with someone who speaks English. If you're an English speaker, learn to dance with someone who speaks Spanish. You've got two for the price of one. But this wonderful challenge that you can make on the brain, right, is going to maintain your, your thinking skills. The same crossword mm. every day, the same puzzle every day. No, it's it won't it won't do the job. I'm afraid. So you you've got to really be pushing, you know, your boundaries and and uh, stretching basically. Yeah, you have. Um, yes, you have. And to. doing so, I I've recently went to a thing where I'm consuming as many books as I possibly can, and I do a lot of it through audiobook. And I'm spending two hours a day at the gym, and it's like I think it's a 15 minute drive each way. Uh, and anytime I'm in the car. Uh, I automatically turn on the audiobook, uh, and I've been consuming just a massive amount of audiobooks. I consume usually about two, two point yeah. five times, which kind of strains my brain at trying. To, what, what, what's going on here with the speed? And um, and I've been loving it because it's really I, I've been just voraciously yeah. learning a lot of stuff. But I, I just kind of feel like I'm almost trying to play catch up. But um, to me, it's challenging my brain. I, I like yeah. video games. You know, some people say oh video games are bad but you know there's there's a bit of a challenge there especially if you're playing against uh, other players that are really good sure. and they have skill levels and and you're you know maybe they're better than yours i i think they're pretty good uh for people to to keep really sharp i don't know you all, all the things that all the things that you've mentioned we call building up your cognitive reserve and oh. we know that that's a big factor in preventing dementia mm -hmm. my mother was largely self-educated uh, and one of the most intelligent women I know, and throughout her life, she read everything in sight. She'd read the she'd read the sauce bottle, the the cornflake packet in the morning at breakfast, um, and she built up this immense knowledge herself. And when she eventually got Alzheimer's disease in her, what was she ninety two? I think she wow. was right. She managed to counter it. For her, it was an emotional experience. It, it led to a lot of emotional up and down. Mm -hmm. For her, it was a uh, you know, a different experience than for most. And she mm. didn't have the memory problems. Why? Because she built it up during her life. We call that cognitive reserve. So all, mm. the, all that stuff, Chris, you're, you're spot on, fella. You've hit the bullseye. Oh, good. I hope I'm on the right track because I got to I gotta <laughs> repair a lot of damage. Uh, before that, most of my cognitive... Uh, yeah. most of my video cognitive... games Video games are okay for the brain as long as you don't become addicted. So yeah. when it becomes a compulsion and you can't leave it alone and you have to have it, that's when you've really got to gr take a grip, get some therapy and move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. I would agree. Anything that, you know, you can do too much of anything. Um, but yeah, I, I've looked at that. I have a sister who has uh, multiple sclerosis. She was denied, uh, she was um, diagnosed, uh, I think in her t late teens. And she has the kind that, that takes you 
fairly quickly you know there's some there's evidently two versions one that you can if you're if you're pretty good to yourself and you can kind of maintain stress and which i don't know how anybody does in this world but she she had the one that will put you in a wheelchair when you're when you're 40 sure. um and uh she's been in care centers for um, many years now but she's got full stage dementia i mean i'm not sure if she knows where she's at from day to day she she i mean she has a cognitive awareness of where she's at like right now but you know she's like you know she she doesn't know where. and so watching her it's really hard to think yeah you know what is that my future is that is that where i'm going how can i maybe you know she she has a genetic disease or well i don't know if it's genetic but she has a disease that clearly is having a, an effect my on daughter her has ms uh, chris so well I, I i know exactly what you're talking about and uh i've thought a lot about uh uh, the underlying um, cause or principle for that, it's a degeneration of nerve cells. Yeah. And so is Alzheimer's disease. That is the degeneration of those nerve cells, uh, the chemistry inside of them and how they talk to all the other brain cells around them. And we've got 85 billion of them. And we've got 86 billion cells looking after those. But if it starts to go wrong and it starts to go wrong quickly and what is what we call pathology sets in you've got the devil's own job to slow it down i'm afraid hmm. so we can slow it down if we try we and can. yeah we i think can. it's harder with ms because it's you know the scabbing system that goes it's kind of random everywhere sure. um that goes on across the uh uh well i, we, I mean if you understand ms but it, it's hard it's definitely hard it is yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, what are those things that you talk about in your book that we can cover? Uh, one of the things I'd like to just go back to is uh, social life, mm -hmm. because that is so, so important. And we can maybe you trying to tell me to get a life, Dr. Uh, Goodwin. <laughs> I don't know your life, Chris, so you'd have to open up to me before yeah, I can do probably. that. One. <laughs> um, there was two great studies done in the U.S. which looked at the uh, health risks of social isolation, being isolated from others, uh, and loneliness. And what they found was loneliness poses the same risk to your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day and drinking a bottle of vodka. Holy crap. And I used to do that bottle of vodka. Oh, I was half a bottle of vodka. <laughs> now, I was about to say there's some people who do that, but I wouldn't recommend it. But yeah, that's yeah. the extent of the health risks. Wow. What really worries me is the people in North you know, the, the, the governments, states, and national level and everybody else and all their advisors, didn't they know this about lockdown? And we just had a new figure uh, in the UK, and that's 40% of all the excess deaths, that's the deaths that wouldn't have occurred anyway, 40% yeah. of all those deaths in care homes with the most vulnerable people, right, would, was due to lack of care and loneliness. Yeah. 40 percent and it's i mentioned earlier the little things every day mm. some people have rich social lives some people are apart from their families some people have poorer social lives it's the little things in life like saying hello to your neighbor good morning good evening have a nice day even yeah. uh, all these little tiny things have been shown to improve the functioning of the brain it's reinforcing that 1.5 million years of evolution that's there yeah, just hugging people, touching people. I mean, yeah. I remember when I was at uh, CES, uh, you know, we weren't supposed to be shaking hands, but I remember when someone held out their hand to me, I looked at it for almost like what seemed like attorney. Like, I know I'm not supposed to shake hands, but I really like this. <laughs> and I didn't used to like it. I didn't used to like going to restaurants where there were lots of people and noise. And now I love to go sit in a restaurant and just sit there and just be like, it's nice to be among human yeah. beings. Um but yeah, my sister uh, in her care center, we couldn't see her for pretty much a year. She, they had her cut off. We could go stand outside the window and wave at her through the window uh, and talk to her through the window. But um, yeah, my mom couldn't hug her. It was, it was really freaking hard. And I think a lot of, especially older people, uh, shut in people in their, in their sure. uh, senior citizen age, really suffered and maybe passed yeah. earlier because... You know, they just didn't, they, they, you couldn't make contact with them. And you're like, well, I don't want to hang out with you because I don't want to give you the virus and kill you, but you may die of loneliness. And it's yeah, really it, is all about, it is all about balancing risks. Yeah. If you'd have been interviewing me before COVID and you'd have said to me, 
James, could you come up with a plan to damage the health of the US nation or any wow. nation for that matter? Wow. How to come up with lockdown? Jesus. It deprives us of exercise, it deprives us of contact with others, it reduces our medical care. We can't go out and shop and get the things that we need. Um, these are the things that are really damaging about a period of lockdown. And personally, in Britain, I don't think we'll ever have a lockdown again because the uh, the cat's out of the bag and people yeah. are beginning to see uh, the damage it's done. Yeah. Well, Chris, it's an extension to social life. How about sexual life? Did you oh, read that yeah, chapter that, in my book? I didn't read the chapter in your book on, on sexual life, but I know that's impacted a lot of people during COVID, yeah. who are, especially well, those who are single, because, you know, married that, people, they don't have that yeah. anyway. Yeah, that, that's uh, that, that's another one. Um, again, we've got to thank scientists in the U.S. This was in uh, Princeton. I think it was about, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. These were animal behaviorists, animal scientists, uh, neuroscientists even, and they were, uh, they were looking at sexual behavior of animals and what, what it did to the brain. And they mm. found that if you introduced a male rat to an unfamiliar female rat, their stress levels were very, very high, mm. but the male did it anyway, even though it was stressful, you know, too, mm. too strange, strange rats. Amazingly, when they checked out their brains, what they found was that that one stressful sexual encounter increased the number of brain cells. So it had helped um, neuro, neurogenesis, that's the production of new brain cells. Mm -hmm. So then they said, well, what happens if we give this dude regular, regular access? Mm -hmm. Well, they gave it regular access to a receptive female, the same receptive female. Guess what? Stress levels went down and the number of new brain cells went through the roof. Wow. So the sexual activity between these two with a familiar, familiar partner, as, as it were, was very, very rewarding to the brain it produced many many new brain cells wow. and then i think it was about 2008 uh scientists in uh, australia mm -hmm. had a look at people <laughs> it, um, what he did was he got uh, many thousands i believe it was about six thousand people over the age of 50 and he tested their mental performance and then got them to record their sexual activity and what he found was that those who had regular sexual activity with a familiar partner had a 20% better memory than those who did not. Wow. This explains why I'm married. So the more, there seems to be, the threshold seems to be once a week. Right? So this explains so the more why I'm It's a dose effect. The more, the more sex that you have with a, with a familiar partner, right, uh -huh. the better the effect is on the brain. And it's not just memory. Math, spatial ability, really? the ability to put words together, um, speed of processing, reaction times, all of this improves through this wonderful activity. Do you want to know why? Why? Well, first of all, it's social. So you've got all the benefits of social interaction with your partner, and that depresses information in the body, helps the brain. Secondly, there's a lot of physical activity involved. Right? Now, there's a thing, yeah, true, there's huh? a thing we call... There's a thing we call MET level, M-E-T, metabolic equivalent of task. You don't need to remember that, just MET level. So sitting down like uh, you and I are, it's about one MET. It's a measurement of how much energy we're expending and how much oxygen we're breathing in. Oh. Well, jogging is six METs, six mm -hmm. to seven METs. Sexual activity is 5.8 METs. Now, that, so that you've might... got an exercise benefit on the brain as well as a social benefit on the brain. Yeah. And then you've got a pleasure benefit because you've got all these pleasure hormones released in the brain and they are antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. They make the brain glow like Vesuvius erupting. Ah. Dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, encephalin, all these wonderful hormones, right? The moment of orgasm fill the brain. That You imagine that once a week, twice a week, three times a week, four times a week, all right? That is going to benefit your brain. I can hear all the married guys I know uh, out there. I'm single, so I kid the married people. But I can hear all my married friends right now. They're going to their wives, going, "Hey, we gotta, we, uh, we gotta fight Alzheimer's, honey. Yeah, we gotta make sure we don't get Alzheimer's." So time to there go. was there was another an app produced by Harvard. It's just a brilliant app called Track Your Happiness. That was yeah. a Track Your Happiness app, and amazingly, millions of people all around the world agreed to have this app if they would take a phone call any time of the day or night. 
and be be asked, how happy are you right now? And what are you doing? Hmm. Well, the activity which hit 95% on the scale of happiness was sex. So I'm imagining somebody in, call during somebody in Paris or Singapore or Rio de Janeiro gets his phone call at 11 o'clock at night. What are you doing? And you're actually there with your partner. What are you doing? Well, if you're okay, answering your it. phone during sex, like you're doing it wrong. That's all I'm number, saying. Number two on the list at 75% was exercise. People really felt happy when they were doing exercise. Yeah. Number three was learning something new, something novel, a new great experience. That was number three. Do you know what the two worst ones were? What? Two worst ones were self-grooming, having to do your hair, having to clean your teeth, oh, you know, getting ready for work in the morning. And bottom of the list, going to the office. Actually, unless it was something people were thrilled about doing, you know, mm-hmm. I, I love being a psychologist or whatever it is. Or you know, I, I, Wouldn't the bottom be going to the dentist? I think that would be like, or going in for oh, colonoscopy. Yeah. I don't know how many the people bottom. they got oh. in the dentist chair, but I, I, you know, I just think they might, they might be like um, ivory tired academics, but those people yeah. at Harvard, they must have had a sense of humor, Chris. I can see all my married guy friends saying to the wife, oh, you have a headache, honey? That might be the onset of Alzheimer's. We should probably supercharge your brain by uh, getting under the whatever. Anyway, um, yeah, this may explain why so many sexless married uh, guy friends are brain dead. Uh, All right. I'm a single guy, so I get to pick on all the married people. Anyway, so this has been a wonderful discussion. Anything more you want to touch on in the book before we go out? Uh, yeah, there's one thing, and this is an amazing discovery that was only made in the no- late 1990s, and that is that the bugs in your bowel, and we all know what's in our large intestine, but that f- fermenting, gurgling mess in there is the world's best pharmaceutical factory. And it is producing enormous volumes of brain good stuff that goes up into our brains and keeps us sharp. A great example of that is the happy hormone serotonin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Serotonin, only 10% of it is made in the brain. 90% of it is made by the bugs in the bowel. That's where it's made. So as a lasting message to people, you've got to look after those microbes down there. Mm. And our diet and how we eat as well, you know, snacking continuously at all hours of the day and night, eating all kinds of crap food and all that that will really hammer those bugs and if you hammer the bugs and you stress the bugs you hammer the brain and you stress the brain wow so So the message is look after them look after what you eat and how good you are you know i've gone through periods of my life where i've gone vegan and then i've also done intermittent fasting lost you know hundreds of pounds um and then of course exercise right now yeah i'm really i'm really loving it because you, you can tell you can just tell you're sharper the world's better. The colors are better. Just everything seems more alive. And yeah, yeah. what you put in your gut uh, makes all the difference. If you're eating garbage food, fast food, soda pops, you know, I used to drink like 10 Mountain Dews a day. I mean, oh, I was wow. really, yeah. And then I drink vodka at night. Um, but, you but know, drinking was... drinking's important. The brain is 80% of, of water. Mm. Of the remaining 20%, that's largely, uh, largely fats. Omega-3 fats and so on. But if you don't drink a glass of water an hour, you are drying out your brain. And you imagine the effects of that over years and years and years. And Chris, come on. How hard is it to drink a glass of water, right? An hour. Oh, it's down. Yep. For some people, it's it's hard because they're so addicted to you know, sugar and tasting, they, they, they've got to, you know, have and sugar addiction. And so I had to overcome all that and think about it. And now I drink water. One of the tricks I have is I have a stainless steel. Uh, there's actually water in my coffee glass right now, but I have a uh, stainless steel that keeps it really cold. And then I get reverse osmosis water. And when I put it in there, man, it's cold all day long. And so I can, sure. you, you tend to like it when, when it's colder. Um, yeah. It has, uh, I think it has like a better flavor. I mean, I'm not really sure if you yeah, qualifies. A, a really flavor. great kind of water to use is ionized water. Mm. Um, and you can buy, you can buy machines that you plug into your, in a bathroom or in the kitchen. And you can just pour a glass of water out of that. Mm. That penetrates the cells of the body real good. And uh, as a result of that, <laughs> I'd recommend people that I drink ionized water and uh, I, I'd recommend it. in Japan, all hospitals, health, 
health um, facilities, all this stuff, they have to have ionized water in them. Now that's alkaline water, right? It's, yeah, that's alkaline water. It's yeah. On. yeah, yeah. I drink. I, I I buy a bunch of bottles of alkaline water, and when I go to the gym, I uh, take this giant uh, these giant bottles that I have. And I read that you know, number one, it, part of what it does, it helps open up your arteries and just just it, it really gets you going. So I drink one of those during the gym, and I'm usually still drinking it. It's a giant bottle. Yeah, still drinking. I think it. about the, the water, the water molecules in regular water. They clump together and they're in fairly fairly big pieces, if you like. Mm. The thing about ionized water is it breaks them down into these little micro clusters, and they go zapping between the cells, and they get you hydrated very quickly. Well, there you go. Well, it's been wonderful you have on the show. Give us your plugs, James, so we can uh, look you up on the interweb. Sure. Um, my personal website, drjamesgoodwin.com. Uh, the company I work for, uh, www.brain.health. And if you want to buy the book, and it's great reading, I have to say, full of stories and artwork, not just science, full of stories and artwork, go to Pegasus Books. Uh, on their website, and you'll you'll find it there. There you go. Thank you very much for coming on the show. We certainly appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Chris. Thank you. There you guys go. Order up the book, Supercharge Your Brain, How to Maintain a Healthy Brain Through Your Life. Also go to YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Voss, uh, Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss. See everything we're reading and reviewing over there in all of our groups. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other, and we'll see you guys next time. Okay. Bye, everyone.